So maybe we will resume with the fourth and the last session of today's symposium, which is dedicated to talk about the interventions to fight cancers. Um, and so here uh, in this session, uh, Pierre Deschamps, who is an economist, will uh, focus on the question of gender quotas and their benefits potential disadvantages. Kaiser Snellmann from INSEAD will talk about how to fix the leaky pipeline and propose that we actually might need to do something else in diversity, so a bit echoing on what we already heard this morning by uh, Professor Elmers. And Mariam Schemert will uh, close uh, the session and the day with giving us some behavioral insights uh, on gender equality and the methods that seem to work and those that seem to uh, haven't worked. Um, before we start actually with the first speaker, I would like to introduce my, my co-chair, Lena Morozova-Fria, uh, who is um, a country representative for France at the Innovation Politics Institute. Lena is also a member of the Board of Administration of EU-focused think tanks, including Europa Nova. She is also an independent consulting, consultant, including for public affairs and public innovation. She has studied behavioral economics in Vermont before doing two masters on interdisciplinary European studies. And Lena uh, most recently holds an MA in public administration from the French National School of Administration. She's here today to co-chair with me and also to share some of her experiences in nonprofit, political and the private sector. I will directly introduce our first speaker now, Dr. Pierre Deschamps who is currently an assistant professor at the Swedish Institute for Social Research at Stockholm University in Sweden. Uh, Pierre's early academic uh, career alternated between his affiliation to Sciences Po in Paris and several stays in the United States, including Washington University and UC Berkeley. He accomplished his PhD at Sciences Po here in Paris, where he studied the effects of gender quotas in hiring committees at French universities. And he will share his work with us today. Please join me in welcoming Pierre. Uh, first, thanks to the organizers for what has been really a fascinating conference so far. So today I'm going to discuss my work on gender quotas in hiring committees in, in academia and whether they can decrease gender bias. Um, but before I start, I'd like to say a few words about gender quotas more generally. I saw that you know during the the previous sessions, we, we already started discussing what we could expect from gender quotas. Um, so actually now they've been in place uh, for a relatively long time. For instance, in Sweden, there's been a gender quota in politics since 1993. Um, and there have been quotas in executive boards, uh, for instance, in Norway since 2003. So we already know and have the data to analyze uh, whether these gender quotas are effective uh, or not. And actually, uh, economists have started doing that quite a bit, so we actually know now whether they are or not, or not effective. Um, and still they generate active, I think, uh, debate both academically and publicly. And most of the debate over gender quotas has centered over two questions, uh, whether they are efficient and whether they trickle down. Does having more women at the top actually benefit women? And I think we kind of discussed this already quite a bit this morning. Are gender quotas efficient? Most of you know the arguments for and against. Um, for those who say that they're not, right, the idea is that um, the men that are selected for, for the top positions are more competent in general. And so uh, if you replace them with women, you're going to decrease um, the average competence of uh, the organization. On the other hand, you, you have people arguing for gender quotas who say that because of discrimination and systemic barriers um, you might not have the most qualified people at the top and that actually gender quotas can both increase competence but also they can increase viewpoint diversity which can in turn lead to efficiency gains. So wh which side is right? Luckily for us that's an empirical question so economists have studied this quite extensively. For the board gender quotas I think most of the evidence finds that there's no effect whatsoever on firm performance or returns of having more women in executive boardrooms. So now that's been studied for board gender quotas in uh, Norway, in Italy, in Germany, and there it's consistent. There's no effect of having more women in the boardroom on firm performance. If anything, there's probably a small positive effect. So at least there, 
it seems that gender quotas are indeed efficient. For political gender quotas, there's actually a, a, a pretty fun paper by one of my co-authors at Sophie, who, um, who with uh, her co-authors, they developed a measure of politician competency, and they studied at what happened to uh, the median politician competency following a gender quota. What they actually find is that the median, um, the median quality of the politician increases with the gender quota, since it's actually mediocre men that are driven out of politics by the new women. So actually here, uh, the, the gender quotas do increase the average quality of the politicians. Um, do they lead to more electoral success? I think that's still up for debate, but papers don't seem to find um, any effect, right? So you can, you can actually test this by seeing which parties have to increase the share of women candidates more following a quota, and there it doesn't seem that that has a particular effect on electoral success. And the second question um, that we might be interested in is whether they trickle down, and there I would say evidence is more mixed. Um, so what I mean by, by trickle down is if you have more women at the top, do they in turn help women or does it benefit women lower down the wage ladder? Here we might be especially interested by the results from the board gender quotas. So if you put more women in the boardroom, does that help women lower down the wage ladder? And there, once again, you know, we've been able to study this in Norway, in Italy, in France, and there's no effect whatsoever. Um, so, gender quotas do seem to be efficient, but we shouldn't expect that just by having more women at the top, we can change uh, the culture of an organization. So now let me talk about my paper, which is about uh, gender quotas in hiring committees in academia. So here I'm framing this as, you know, do gender quotas trickle down in academia, as in, if we have more women in the committees that make the hiring and promotion decisions, should we expect more women to be hired and promoted? And before I go, I go into this, I just wanted to share some data on the gender gaps in academia. Okay, so this is the data from the European Union. This is the share of women and men at all stages of an academic uh, career. So he said uh, six and seven, that's the uh, master students. Afterwards, you have the PhD students, grade C, assistant professors, B, associate, and grade A, full professors. So this is all disciplines taken together. And what's really striking is that there's an enormous amount of vertical segregation, right? So um, there seems to be slightly a leaky pipeline in moving from uh, the master's level to the PhD level. Then it seems to be, the proportions seem to be pretty stable right until we hit the associate and full professor stage, where you know, we move from almost gender parity at the PhD stage to this proportion of 75% um, men that are full professors. So there is vertical segregation, and there is also um, segregation across fields. Okay, so this is the exact same graph, but here we're only looking at STEM fields. And there what we see, right, is that um, we see also the same vertical segregation, right? But here we see also that the imbalance starts much earlier than it does if we take all disciplines into account. So probably there are two, two different problems, right? When we're thinking about gender gaps in academia, there's both entry into STEM, which probably we're gonna need much early interventions. And there's also segregation that seems to occur really at the full professor stage. So what I do in my paper is I'm going to study the effect of a gender quota in France on the members of academic hiring committees. And this was really passed specifically as a you know, general law that was made to fight against gender bias. So some of you, I'm guessing, have probably sat on some of these uh, French academic hiring committees. So you probably uh, already know the law I'm talking about. But since 2015 onwards, uh, these French academic hiring committees have to be made up of at least 40% men and 40% women. So the question I'm asking is very simple, you know, is uh, 
this reform going to have any effect at all on the hiring of women? And so can it be a potential solution to solve either of these gender gaps that we've seen in the raw stats? Uh, so first, let me just give you a little bit of a um, description of how these hiring committees in France actually work. So whenever a position is created by, um, by the university, you need to create a specific committee for that position. Um, and those are chaired by a committee president who has broad powers, and in particular, I think he pretty much gets to decide who actually sits on uh, the, the committee. They're relatively large, between 8 and 20 members, and so since 2015 they must have 40% of each gender. What they do is, they receive the applications, so in my data, you know, these range from 10 or 15 applications to sometimes 150, 200, depending on the type of position. Then they decide which candidates are good enough to go to an audition stage, and then they give a final ranking. Uh, which is binding. So anyone who's ranked can potentially receive an offer if the people above uh, reject them. And so I have data from three different universities that goes from you know, 2009 to 2018. And I have access to really detailed data, so I know who was in the committee, I know the final ranks, I know the gender composition of the applicant pool, and to this data, you know, I added data from Google Scholar on number of publications, uh, the H index of candidates, and also whether the um, uh, thesis director of the candidate was also in the committee. So, first, did the reform actually work? Okay, so here on the x-axis, we have the mean share of women in recruitment committees for each different lab that I have. So the blue dot was the mean share of women in these academic hiring committees before the reform. The red squares are the mean share of women in uh, recruitment committees after the reform. So if we ask, was the reform successful? Quite clearly, yes, right? So we see before um, the reform, there are quite a few labs where there was no gender parity in the academic hiring committee and afterwards we almost seem to move to a new norm, right, which is not 40%, but actually seems to be closer to 50%. So what I'm going to do in, in the paper is to compare fields that were to the left of the threshold, of this 40% threshold before the reform, to um, the labs that were to the right. So you have a treatment group, which is fields that weren't respecting the quota beforehand, and the control group are going to be all these labs that were already respecting the quota. So it's essentially comparing fields like math and physics to biology, psychology, languages. And the effect of the reform is pretty strikingly, um, strongly negative, as we can see in this graph. Okay, so doesn't seem to be much going on before the reform, right, as we would expect. And what we can see is already from 2015, there's a strong, so, sorry, on, so the, this is the effect of being uh, a woman on your rank when controlling for publications and connections and so on. As we can see, um, there's a strong negative effect to the reform and it seems to get also worse and worse as time goes on. So we can actually break this down between what's going on in the treatment group and in the control group. And actually what we see, right, so the treatment group is the solid line and the control group is the dashed line. And so in the treatment group, which was these fields that were not strongly feminized uh, and that had few women in recruitment committees before the reform, uh, being a woman actually had a positive effect on the way you were ranked by the committee before the reform. And that just drops dramatically as soon as the reform is passed. There doesn't seem to be uh, much going on in the control group. So it really seems to be something that's driven by these fields that were strongly affected by having more women in these recruitment committees. And the effect is relatively large, so it's about three percentage points, around 7%. Um, in the paper, I do lots of things to show that it's not a, a spurious result. Uh, 
So th this was the main effect, and then there were you know secondary questions that we could be interested in. So for instance, um, there's a lot of talk about role models. So perhaps you know, okay, there's no direct effect on hiring, but maybe it could be that if you have more women in the recruitment committees, you can also convince more women to actually apply for the jobs, right? But there I don't find anything in the short term. So perhaps there could be something in the long term, at least in the short term, I don't see any effect on the likelihood of women applying, of changing the composition of these hiring committees. Um, it seems to be that it's mostly, so you know, in these committees you have half internal, half external members of, uh, of the institution. And what I see in my data seems to be mostly the internal members that have to contribute more. And if we think about, you know, we were talking about administrative burden earlier on, uh, women having to take on more non-promotable tasks. It's quite likely that in these fields where you have few women, it might uh, imply a lot more administrative work, which is not necessarily rewarded. Third point is on the you know, effectiveness of the jury, and I think once again that's kind of a constant. I look at the average number of um, average age index of jury members, that doesn't change with the reform. So it seems that you know if we're thinking about the quality of the hiring committee, that doesn't seem to change. And the the last fact is pretty striking. So we move on average in the treatment group from um, 30% uh, to 43% um, of women. So we have a huge increase in the share of women in hiring committees, but we have 30% female committee presidents before the reform and 30% afterwards. Okay, so these committee presidents, which are the most powerful positions, but have no quota requirements, actually there's no effect of the reform whatsoever on them. And um, actually, we might be so. Yeah. So, then, what is driving these these results? Is it actually that women don't want to hire women? And so, in sociology, there's a literature on the it's called the queen bee effect. And I don't think that's actually what's behind the behind my results, since the entire effect of the reform is driven by male jury presidents. So, to me, that seems to. Um, indicate that it's actually the men who are in the committees that change their behavior as a result of the reform and actually there was another paper that was looking here at so it was a slightly different mechanism because it was also hiring committees but there people were randomly assigned to the committees and they found that when men had more women that were randomly drawn to their committees they also became more negative towards women so um, it's a slightly uh, depressing result. We don't quite know. We don't quite know why it happens. I mean, in the type of deeper motivations, is it that you know men are kind of pissed off because they had a quota put on them, and so you know they they decide to take revenge? Is it just that they think, oh well, now look, there's more women in the hiring committee, so we don't need to do anything to fix the gender balance of the field? Um, that I don't know. What I find interesting though is the thought that actually we're talking about homophily earlier, but well it might be actually that there's no true homophily but there's a gender bias that could be you know context dependent. You can have the same person and depending on who's around him he's going to be gender biased or not, right? And so uh, I guess as a slight note, hopeful note for the future, maybe if we can understand what context can lead to less gender bias, we might be able to fix these kind of problems in the future and the gender gaps we were talking about at the start. Um, yeah, so that's uh, my conclusion, which is that if we want to solve the gender gaps in academia, it doesn't seem like these gender quotas in hiring committees are going to do much good and they may even actually worsen outcomes for women. So um, what policies work? Uh, this is very economic centric, but at least in economics we don't quite know uh, very much. I guess if we did, we could solve it. But um, yeah, so there's uh, uh, there's a literature on what doesn't work. So there, there was this uh, kind of really striking paper on ten o'clock stopping policies that you might have heard about. So ten o'clock stopping policy is you get an extra year on your ten o'clock for every child that you have. And so this paper actually found that these policies have small positive effects if only women get them. But if they're gender neutral, 
then actually men spend all their time uh, publishing more papers and not taking care of the children. So um, they tend to have uh, negative effects on the tenure prospects of women. So probably there's some room for improvement there. Um, there's also a slightly depressing literature that looks at uh, research showing so it's research showing differences in recognition of work. So the first paper shows that women are held to higher standards in, in publishing. Um, so there it's looking at citations and you know, for a similar level of publications, women tend to have more citations. And so the authors argue that it means they're held to higher standards uh, for publication. The second one seems to be specific to, economi to economics, but is uh, it's really striking. So basically it says for equal publications, women in economics have an 11% smaller chance of getting tenure. And it's entirely driven by the fact that when they come up for tenure review, um, the papers that women write with men accounted as, uh, accounted as zero because um, because the people in the ten tenure committee assume men wrote them, and that you know, if when they write papers only with women, then they have the exact same tenure probability rate. And the final paper um, shows that so it's pretty neat actually. So the the author has a machine learning algorithm to predict which papers should be cited by each other. And so you know, you can say, okay, these papers are very similar according to machine learning, so. They should, be, they should be cited, and she finds that uh, men are less likely to, to, to cite women. Mm -hmm. Okay, not, not very good news. Um, <laughs> I guess this gets back to uh, what Naomi was talking earlier, you know, but now once we know these biases, is it enough now that we're aware of them, uh, to decrease them? Um, I hope so. We shall see. The, the two, um, two interventions I, I saw that had a success in academia, again, this is very economic literature, maybe in your own field you're aware of, of more initiatives, but it seems to be uh, mentoring and role models. So um, these two papers, so one was in France actually, so it, this one was seeing high school students and just having women um, in, in uh, STEM positions just go and speak to, uh, to high school students and say actually it's cool to go to STEM because you know, you're well paid, it's interesting. Uh, and actually that was enough to increase enrollment in STEM, so this, this was an RCT. That increased enrollment in STEM by more than two percentage points. So a pretty big effect. The second one, this was about econ undergrad and choosing uh, econ majors. They uh, doubled the rate, again, just by having someone intervene um, at the start of the, of the undergrad semester. Um, so it really seems that having women talk to, um, to students in these STEM fields has a large effect on whether women choose a STEM career. And so the, the second paper is more about you know, these, uh, this seniority gap. Um, so there in economics they did an RCT where some women had access to some kind of mentoring retreat with other senior professors and that, that actually had pretty strong effects on tenure and publication rates. So th those are the two interventions I found that kind of worked. So yep, that's it. <laughs>